Good evening, everyone. We're about to get started, so we are very honored and excited to have you all join us. We have a big crowd, so it's very exciting for an amazing panel of experts we have with us tonight uh, who will be helping us process and learn more about literacy education, both in our great state of Illinois and across the country. I'm Dr. Jennifer Miller, and I'm the new Dean of the College of Education here at DePaul University. It's been a wonderful first seven months, and I'm certainly enjoying taking in all that is DePaul and that is Chicago. We've been offering these educational forums at DePaul for several years. We're very grateful to Diane Horowitz for her advocacy and continued planning. Our goal with these forums is to engage in critical topics of the day in education and bring together a community of learners to support continued study and also to support enhancement in our practices and in our partnerships across the educational auspices. I was a first grade teacher for many, many years before I came into higher education, and I feel like I've been through at least two cycles, maybe three, of the reading wars, and certainly saw changes to my own classroom practice as we moved from whole language into balanced literacy and back to phonics and through the whole range of things that we do to support um, young children and learning to read uh, and all of our students. The really critical question of our time, I would argue, is moving from literacy to literacies and how we think and rethink about how we support multilingualism for all and then full literacy development across all areas of our already, for our already multilingual students and their families. So welcome. We're glad you've committed to spending time engaged in learning on this very important uh, issue and topic. Enjoy the evening and this incredible panel of experts. And now I will turn things over to my amazing colleague who is moderating the forum this evening. Dr. Marie Donovan is an Associate Professor of Teacher Education and Director of our program in Early Childhood Education. And she's amazing. She's making me blush. Well, thank you. Thank you, Dean Mueller. And especially thank you and the College of Education for sponsoring tonight's forum. And so good evening, everyone, and welcome to our Winter Quarter Education Forum. We're, we're just so gratified to see just how much interest folks have been expressing in tonight's focus, but we're also not surprised. As you'll be hearing from our presenters, the brand new Illinois Comprehensive Literacy Plan, the link to which is in your chat, and you also received a link in your registration email. This plan is one of many that have been recently developed by various states as a way to build coherence among their schools and the grade levels in those schools around how students' literacy needs to be developed and fostered. Now, based on our re registration records, the over, well, almost 600 of you attending tonight represent the key stakeholders in our education system, the teachers, parents, administrators, librarians, school board members, and especially our DePaul students who are pre-service teachers, counselors, and school leaders. We're so glad you're here. Again, thanks so much for coming. Now, I have many to thank for bringing tonight's forum to fruition. As uh, Dean Miller mentioned, first and foremost, I want to acknowledge my colleague, Dr. Diane Horwitz, whose vision and devotion to organizing these forums for 13 years now remains as fresh and as critical as, it, as they were at the start. So thank you, Diane, for your genuinely heartfelt work and always savvy way of identifying timely topics and issues for us to explore together. Now, we wouldn't be here tonight, literally, if not for the organizing, advertising, and technical support from Maya Mushitz, our Director of Communications for the college. Thank you, Maya, for your attention to detail, especially all those ones that the rest of us tend to forget. And thank you, too, to our graduate assistant, Shaji Lu, who also is running the technology behind the scenes. Again, we'd be nowhere without the two of you. Literally, we'd be lost in cyberspace. Now, our aim for tonight's forum is simple, to gather around our screens, to listen, learn, and consider. Our three speakers will share their work and perspectives on the development of statewide literacy plans, in particular, ours in Illinois. Now, we recognize that some of you aren't as aware of the Illinois plan as are others, and for that matter, nor is everyone familiar with its contents. It's about 200 pages, as I recall. So we'll all learn much about the Illinois plan tonight, but moreover, in the limited time we have together, we'll no doubt raise more questions than answer ones. And that's okay. 
We hope that you'll take your learning and your questions generated from attending tonight to your own schools and raise them with your colleagues because it's through this local level deliberation that the plan will come to life and mean something more than a document on a server somewhere. We've invited three educators to join us this evening. Dr. Paul Thomas, who will describe the national context of literacy plans like ours in Illinois. Ms. Cristina Sanchez Lopez, multilingual educator, who will summarize the plan's genesis and its timeline. And Ms. Kathy Manning, who will focus on the role of educators in moving the plan forward. You will receive the, our presenters' complete bios along with the slide decks and a link to the recording of the forum approximately one week from tonight. Now our format is straightforward. I'll introduce our speakers. Once they share their initial thoughts, we'll have a Q&A. So please be sure to post questions that you'd like us to respond to in the chat. We can't promise to get to all of them, but I'll be monitoring the chat to see what themes are emerging and make sure that we can get to at least some of, some of those themes. And so our first speaker this evening is Dr. Paul Thomas, Professor of Education at Furman University in Greenville, South Carolina. Dr. Thomas began his education career as a high school teacher in rural South Carolina before moving into teacher education and education policy research. Dr. Thomas currently serves as the series editor for the Brill Publishing Company's critical literacy teaching series, Challenging Authors and Genres. His most recent book is How to End the Reading Wars and Serve the Literacy Needs of All Students. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Thomas back to the DePaul Forum series. Dr. Thomas? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Marie. Thank you, Diane. Thank you, um, DePaul. Uh, I'm going to do a, hopefully not too quick, but do a very quick overview. I, I've been teaching literacy for 40 years, and this is my sixth year working on the science of reading. And what I'm going to try to do, <clears throat> excuse me, is offer a, an overview of the science of reading movement, which is influencing reading um, legislation in at least uh, 30 uh, to 47 states in the United States. So the first thing I want to talk about is the grounding of this movement is a media claim, a media story that we're in a reading crisis. And if you look at this uh, diagram here, um, if we use NAEP data there's really no evidence that there is a reading crisis. And part of that is a misunderstanding of NAEP. Uh, the NAEP proficiency level is well above grade level. And you'll see in many media report, in much of media reporting, uh, the claim that two thirds of students aren't at proficiency. And then sometimes that will be mixed with two thirds of students aren't at grade level. Uh, the irony of that claim is, according to NAEP, about two-thirds of students in the United States are at grade level or above. And you'll see here, which I think is really important, some key moments, but uh, essentially from about uh, the 1990s until now, there's been a pretty steady, what most researchers would say, a flat line uh, of NAEP data uh, that shows that reading achievement is about the same over the last at least three decades. And uh, very important to understand, I think, is that the science of reading is what I call a multiverse. Uh, we have the media, public, and parent science of reading, which I would say is the story, which people are probably more familiar with uh, with something like Hard Words by Emily Hanford or uh, Hanford Sold a Story. And that's been extremely influential. So we have a media uh, and political narrative that kind of merge so that we have uh, policy and legislation that comes out of claims in the media. Uh, we also have the science of reading as marketing. And uh, those of us in education have a great a lot a lot, a lot of familiar, familiarity with how marketing influences what we do in education. And the most recent version of that, I would say, is Common Core. Uh, and assuming this Common Core was kind of the fad, everything was labeled Common Core, and states adopted Common Core. And then just about as quickly as it came, it went. 
uh, a very similar thing is happening with the science of reading. And then all third, I would say we have an actual body of reading science, which is, you know, a century long. Uh, it's very complicated and it has almost no relationship with uh, the first two versions of the science of reading. Most often the, the media and the political versions of the science of reading misrepresent what we actually know in that body of research. So one thing I think we have to be very concerned about is that merging of media, political, and marketing. And uh, it's hard to grasp, but most of that is very conservative. Uh, it fits into the uh, sort of the accountability uh, crisis rhetoric of education that goes back to the 1980s and uh, Reagan's A Nation at Risk. And it, it was reinforced by George W. Bush's uh, no Child Left Behind. So for at least 40 years, and we're we're working into our fifth decade of saying that education is in crisis, and we just keep recycling education is in crisis, students are failing, teachers are failing, and public schools are failing, and we never get out of that cycle. Um, also, along with uh, the influence of like No Child Left Behind and the National Reading Panel, it's very important to understand um, that Jeb Bush's Excel in Ed has a huge influence uh, on um, reading legislation. And Florida was one of the early uh, states to implement uh, reading uh, reform that was grounded in mostly in grade retention. And then more recently, we've seen the same thing with Mississippi. Uh, so the science of reading movement, uh, in my opinion, is nothing new. It's very, uh, very much fits into this sort of crisis and miracle uh, cycles that we've seen uh, since the early 1980s. And I recommend here the work of Maren Ackerman. Uh, she does a really good job of laying out how uh, there's a media story that is misinformation and that mis misinformation is that we're in a reading crisis, which is hard to uh, prove with evidence, uh, that teachers don't know how to teach reading, which also there is no evidence to prove that, uh, that specific reading programs have failed children. Again, there's no evidence to prove that. Uh, and that, that we are somehow kind of uh, willfully choosing not to use the evidence that we have to teach children to read, which kind of defies logic. Um, and the marketing, I think, is very, very important to understand. Um, the uh, A lot of the impetus behind the science of reading movement is to discredit some reading programs that are uh, being implemented over the last 10 or 20 years and to create space for new um reading programs. And, and I would argue that a, a serious problem in a lot of the legislation is banning specific programs and practices and mandating different programs and practices. And I think that's the fundamental problem that we should be concerned about. Um, uh, while we are kind of ignoring, while we're doing the program shuffle, uh, the irony is that we are ignoring that there is a body of research. The body of research itself is extremely complicated. Um, there is no evidence that systematic phonics for all students is the solution. Um, and But the media portrays that. So you get the, um, the legislation that is imposing a mandate on a narrative that isn't true. Um, and the sad thing is that once again, we're we're basically ignoring uh, what the research says because, and I think because it is very complicated and because we are kind of program oriented. Um, and I would say here are the key issues uh, that are uh, uh, in that media story and then result in legislation. Uh, the focus on systematic phonics, uh, the uh, inordinate focus on brain research, 
Uh, many states are adopting letters training for teachers because there is a story that teachers don't know how to teach reading and that teacher education has failed. Um, there is a, uh, a hyper focus on dyslexia and and uh, approaches like Orton Gillingham. And there is a, you know, a, a messaging that balanced literacy and reading programs have failed. Um, there is a kind of a, I would say, an uncritical embracing of grade retention. And then we have states like Mississippi and I would say also Florida that are disproportionately represented as miracles uh, because of grade four um, uh, achievement. Uh, but we ignore that both states have significant drop offs in grade eight. Um, and we rely on reports like from groups from uh, NCTQ that are not scientific. And I would say the, the pattern that you would see in all of these is the messaging doesn't match the claim of science. None of these things have science to uh, back them up. And I think that's the fundamental problem with the movement. And I believe um, I'm going to pause here and we're going to move on. So I'll move it, uh, uh, hand it back over to Marie. Sorry about that. I've been looking at things in the chat. So thank you, Paul. Thanks very much. And so. Let me just get my right screen over here. Forgive me. My apologies for, I'm sure I'm not alone in having way too many tabs open on my computer. So thanks again, Dr. Thomas. So our next presenters are two veteran educators who work, whose work as teachers, teacher educators, and teacher advocates is pretty well known in our state. Ms. Cristina Sanchez Lopez, whom I'm proud to call my DePaul colleague in bilingual education. Well, that is when she's not also busily teaching, lecturing, writing, going out there advocating about the work she does, uh, you know, all for, you know, um, ensuring multilingual learners do learn in our schools. Uh, Christina is also a uh, former middle school teacher who's taught in the U.S. and Mexico. She's the author, co-author of numerous publications, including book chapters, articles, and white papers. And she's going to be starting us off in just a moment. But first, I, but before Christina begins, though, I also want to introduce Ms. Kathy Mannon, who is a former early elementary classroom teacher, reading recovery teacher, and instructional coach in public schools in a small urban community here in Illinois. And Ms. Manning now serves as the Union Professional Issues Director at the Illinois Federation of Teachers, where she concentrates on early childhood care and education, as well as induction and mentor policy and practice issues. And so Christina is going to go first and then Kathy, and they've been working together to share with you, you know, a fuller picture of where did this plan come from? What's in it? What does it mean for us as educators? And so, Christina, I'd like to turn things over to you first. Thank you, Marie. And uh, thank you to the to DePaul College of Education for holding this event. And thank you, Dr. Thomas, for that review of the national landscape. Um, I'd like to share a brief timeline of events that have led us to where we are now in the Illinois Comprehensive Literacy Plan. Uh, as in many states uh, across the country and legislatures, uh, here in Illinois, we uh, also had a bill introduced in early, in actually January 2022. Senator Lightford and Representative Mayfield proposed a right to rebuild that was set to pass uh, very quickly in the Illinois Senate uh, on by February 25th of uh, 2022. And... Um, so you can see below, again, I don't need to read to you, the many of the components of the bill. Uh, there were many, many very specific uh, components and specific language uh, throughout the bill. And uh, we couldn't help but notice that these elements were actually identical to bills proposed uh, in other and uh, passed in other states uh, prior to coming to Illinois. And um, so during that time, the Latino Policy Forum uh, for to which we owe a great debt of gratitude, took the lead in initially convening multiple stakeholders to come to the table to weigh in on this right to read legislation and uh, to gather multiple stakeholder perspectives and to begin the conversation. 
So I, again, you will have this handout. So I'm I'm not reading these comments to you, but my purpose is to let you know that during this negotiate this negotiation of uh, multiple stakeholder groups from all over the state, um, these are some of the comments and concerns that were communicated during those negotiation. And um, this was prior to any talk of a literacy plan, but many of these uh, concerns came up uh, throughout the conversations. Just highlighting some, the fact that Illinois has 852 individual school districts, and it's not possible for um, a one size fits all approach to meet the needs and address the uh, concerns of all of these districts that have such diverse populations, you know, from Northern to Central to Western to Southern Illinois. Um, and uh, I just want to share, there's just another, another slide. These are other concerns. Uh, again, highlighting just one of them here was that it was clear in the conversation and the concerns that literacy practices shouldn't be legislated, that that, that isn't something, that isn't really the purview of legislation that really it should be something that we put back on to our State Board of Education that has a lot of experience uh, doing this kind of work. And so um, uh, thanks to practitioners, administrators, education advocates engaging in conversations with the Senator um, through these thoughtful discussions led to moving the concerns again about literacy education in Illinois out of the legislative process and the shifting the responsibility to provide guidance to the State Board of Education. So I'm just gonna go here. Again, I won't read these two, but those are resources that you can uh, look at. But it was amazing that people from so many different stakeholder groups had very similar concerns and saw some of these um, issues emerge. So how has the legislation and this legislative process evolved since the 2022-2023 um, negotiations. So the State Board of Education began the process and engaged a stakeholder engagement meeting uh, in Bloomington on October 25th, 2022. And I have to say it was a really amazing event. Uh, there present were stakeholders from all across Illinois, literally all across <laughs> Illinois. Um, representing school districts, higher education, parent groups, early childhood, multilingual education, special education, gifted ed, unions, as well as consultants in various fields. Actually, actually, I, I forgot to mention parents. There are also parents of students uh, also. And I think student representation as well. Um, so that was, it was a really amazing uh, day. And uh, right below, when you get the handout, um, under where it says stake, literacy stakeholder engagement meeting, uh, there's a link to the sort of proceedings and the summary of themes that came out uh, during that meeting. So this was to inform then the process of writing the literacy plan. So I'm going to jump ahead a little bit. So currently, uh, uh, three ha uh, bills have been passed since the 2022-2023 negotiation. So this uh, literacy, Illinois Literacy for All, Act provides the State Board of Education um, to adopt and make available to school districts a rubric by which districts may evaluate curricula and select and implement evidence-based culturally inclusive core reading instruction programs, a template to develop literacy plans, and guidance on evidence-based practices. It also requires the State Board to develop training opportunities in teaching reading and a comprehensive literacy plan for the state. Um, it also amends the school code, makes it changes concerning the reading improvement block grant program, the requirements to uh, receive a professional education li educator license, uh, taking a test in reading foundations for certain licensure, and the requirements for educators trained in other states uh, or countries effective immediately. So what I've done is linked uh, the full language of these bills in this act uh, here. So then that led to um, what we have now is the, the next task was to build the literacy, Illinois literacy plan. So ISPE uh, developed multi-perspective writing groups. Uh, again, I'm, I don't need to read this to you, but um, uh, the, and it was again, very representative, very 
um, reflective of that convening in uh, Bloomington back in October. And really, we got to talk to people from all over the uh, all over the all over the state, really, and from very different perspectives. And I think everybody learned quite a lot. Um, this uh, ISB also convened listening tours across the state and incorporated uh, written and in-person feedback from all stakeholders groups to each draft of the literacy plan. And then the um, ISB, the State Board of Education, approved the final version of the comprehensive literacy plan. And that is linked actually in the handout, and I believe you received that. So um, I just wanted to link also, there's a Spanish version, uh, again, a draft of, of the uh, literacy plan as well that you can find on the website. And this is just from the ISBE website that goes through the sort of timeline of uh, that, that particular process. Um, I'll come back in a little bit to talk about the multilingual learner language within the plan. But right now, I'd like to turn the presentation over to my colleague, Kathy Mannon. Thanks, Christina. Um, let's see, I'm gonna try and share my screen as well. Uh, I think I'm sharing. Are you still are you still sharing, Christina? Yes. Yes. Okay. okay. Um, let me just make sure I am. Yes. Yes, I see it now. Okay, okay. great, okay. great. Thank you. Um, uh, I too would like to um, thank DePaul University for um, putting this together and all of uh, Diane's behind the scenes work um, and my colleagues, um, Dr. Thomas and Christina for um, sharing all of your knowledge and expertise uh, and experience this evening and uh, appreciate the opportunity to um, be a part of this with you all. So um, I, I want to just, first of all, just give a shout out to um, all the work that pre-K through 12 educators, higher education educators are doing. You all are the experts in your fields. Um, you are the experts in your content, um, your content standards. Um, you're the experts about your students. And um, your work is so important. And so I just wanted to, you know, thank you for the work that you're doing um, with, with children and youth and young adults every day. Uh, some educators, you know, you may look at this um, comprehensive plan and, uh, um, you know, feel a message that that teachers need fixing, you know, sort of what, you know, what Dr. Thomas was referring to. Um, but others of you may look at the literacy plan and you may find that it reinforces uh, and reaffirms what you've been doing in the classroom for years. Uh, but I think what we all can acknowledge uh, is that um, there's always room for improvement, that at both a systems level and an individual teacher level, we can all be engaging in the continuous improvement and learning process. So what the Illinois Comprehensive Literacy Plan um, is intended to be is guidance for districts, not a specific blueprint for teaching, reading, and writing. It provides an overview of research and instructional assessment practices, and it's applicable across the pre-K through 12 continuum. There are five main sections of the plan in addition to the introduction. It covers topics such as effective evidence-based literacy instruction, educator professional learning and development, including educator preparation, and effective literacy leadership, support and implementation considerations and tools and resources. Um, so let's talk for a couple minutes about some of the improvements that we found uh, from the second draft to the final draft of the plan. The final draft of the plan definitely presents a more comprehensive approach to describing the complexity and nuances of literacy and instruction and acquisition. One of our concerns with earlier drafts was that it was over-focused on reading with less focus on the other components of literacy. Um, but recognizing that literacy acquisition is cognitively complex. Uh, and I think, you know, when Dr. Thomas was talking about the complexity of the research, um, you know, that really rings true. And to be effective, reading really has to be taught within a balance of all the components of literacy. It's not a linear process. Um, cognitively, multiple things are happening simultaneously. And so as teachers, one of the things that we do is we help students connect the new to the known. So to, um, to find a more comprehensive approach in the final draft was uh, really appreciated. 
We were also pleased to see that there was an acknowledgement that explicit and systematic is not the only approach to teaching literacy, um, that constructive or constructivist or discovery-based approaches are also appropriate, and that the use of both of those things creates a well-rounded and adaptive learning environment. There really is no one-size-fits-all approach that's appropriate for all learners. So while some students might need more isolated skills and instruction and practice, they also need to take what they've learned in isolation and then apply that to meaningful continuous text, both in reading and in writing. Uh, and then finally, in section one, which is the section that described the seven components of literacy, again, much more comprehensive than previous drafts. It really describes instructional practices rather than programs and includes um, considerations for multilingual learners, advanced learners, learners with specialized needs, assessment and intervention supports for each component of literacy. So while there were certainly some improvements from draft two to the final draft, there are still some ongoing concerns. First of all, um, we were, IFT was disappointed that classroom teachers were again, um, specifically uh, excluded from being identified as teacher leaders. We know that teacher leaders are not just roles outside of the classroom. Teacher leaders possess specific knowledge, skills, and dispositions that can be demonstrated both inside and outside of the classroom. This was something that we commented on specifically for both draft one and draft two of the plan. And to not recognize the leadership of classroom teachers really can be demoralizing to educators. So something we would really like to see uh, you know, as this plan continues to evolve is a recognition that classroom teachers are also teacher leaders. The final plan also uh, overemphasizes the weight that standardized tests should hold. Standardized tests, we know uh, the outcomes of those are heavily correlated to students' family income and that there are racial biases built into the tests themselves. We do have significant concerns in how districts will, re will react to this at the local district and school level, potentially resulting in increased um, testing of students using vendor-based tests and a de-emphasis on formative assessment which is so critical to teachers to provide them timely information so that they can immediately adjust um, and adapt their instruction to where their students are. It's so important for assessments to be rooted in classroom instruction and practice, and vendor-based assessments by their nature are not going to closely connect with classroom content and practice. While formative assessment practices really are an integral part of classroom practice and, and instruction and content. So within a balanced assessment system, teachers use an array of formative assessments to understand and meet individual student needs, and that this practice within an assets-based, culturally affirming environment is empowering for students. Uh, most troubling is that while the final draft of the plan reinforces local control and autonomy for school districts in Illinois, it really doesn't go far enough to explicitly say that teachers should have a meaningful voice in literacy decisions at the school and district level. Teachers are the experts in their content. Um, they are the experts about their students and um, they should be at every table where decisions about teaching and learning are being made because they and their students are directly impacted by those decisions. We do still have some remaining concerns related to uh, the lack of clarity on expectations for education preparation programs and lack of meaningful information on effective in-service professional learning. The state literacy plan actually describes different PD delivery models, all of which has, have a virtual component and calls them strategies, and it really presents a narrow view of educator professional learning. Uh, and, and, you know, we really like to think about education or professional learning as something that occurs across a continuum, beginning with pre-service experiences all the way across the career uh, of a teacher. And it's not, um, it's really not really realistic to expect that first year teachers are going to come out of their prep program and have the same level of knowledge and skills as teachers with several years of experience. And it's also not realistic to expect that we can then layer on more requirements on teacher prep programs and pre-service teacher candidates. Teachers are learning all throughout their careers. And as uh, early career educators gain more experience, they become more well-rounded in their literacy and assessment practices. 
And so just like there's no one size fits all um, approach for teaching students, there's no one size fits all for professional learning for teachers. And so I think, you know, that's really an area where we fall short across the state is in meeting the varied learning needs of educators. We need to make sure that educator professional learning is differentiated and meaningful for teachers across their career continuum. Finally, while this isn't really um, a specific concern with the plan itself, but more about a caution about how districts respond, it's really important to keep in mind that publishing companies are not the experts. There is no magic box vendor-based curriculum that's going to be right for all students. Um, and publishing companies are in business to make a profit. So I think it's fair um, you know, for us to recognize that a response we can expect from publishing companies is that they're gonna advertise and market their products and say that they are aligned to the state literacy plan, when in fact, all they may do is reorganizing existing products and call it align, uh, aligned. And so you know, recognizing they're gonna be on a quest to make a profit off of districts limited financial resources and use the state literacy plan as the catalyst to do that. I'm gonna uh, kick it back to uh, Christina, uh, who's gonna uh, give us some more um, important information around the literacy plan and multilingual learner learners. And Christina, if I may, before you um, begin, audience, we would love your questions, love your comments. So please do get busy in the chat and we'll have time for Q&A. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Kathy, for that. And actually what you were mentioning at the end uh, and, and connecting it to what Dr. Thomas said about media, I, I've already seen some things in the media about the Illinois Literacy Plan. And it made me think, I don't think they've read the plan <laughs> because the claims that they're making sound really like, um, like the same uh, conversation that was being had before. Uh, whereas I think this literacy plan does something very different or hopefully will do something very different. So I think that uh, we do have to be cautious uh, about what we uh, consume in the, the media around this literacy plan. And, and as Kathy said, be at the table. So the, the next section really is to look at a little bit of the language um, around multilingual learners that was included in the uh, comprehensive literacy plan. Uh, but first of all, I'd like to, I really would like to acknowledge the work of a group of educators, administrators, university faculty, and others who, uh, parents as well, who ha have continued meeting and collaborating to advocate on behalf of multilingual learners, their families and teachers since the October 2022 convening in Bloomington at the start of this conversation. This group of individuals have dedicated hours of their time to participate in writing, reading, advocating, and providing written and in-person feedback to all versions of the plan. Uh, the group formally became the, a state affiliate of the National Committee for Effective Literacy to continue to advocate for the education of multilingual learners in uh, Illinois. So I, uh, we owe a great debt of gratitude to those professionals. In addition to their many, many, many hours of work, they spent uh, at least that many hours also uh, working on supporting and advocating for multilingual learners. So I'm going to limit my, um, or focus primarily on the introduction and section one of the literacy plan as it contains most of the explicit re uh, references to multilingual learners, as well as general elements and language I find in the entire plan that are, while they don't mention multilingual learners, these are also supportive of the education or the literacy education of multilingual learners. I'm going to refer to that language that I see as bright spots in the plan. And then I'm gonna share some concerns and then I'm gonna share with you uh, uh, some charts, a couple of charts that again, I don't need to read to you, but where I'm going to give you some page references where specific language about multilingual learners uh, can be found. So the first section is in the introduction, vision and purpose and uh, looking at some of the multilingual um, language that's supportive. So um, just really feeling proud to be in a person from Illinois, an Illinoisan, because being able to all agree on the term comprehensive literacy, as um, um, call, uh, Kathy mentioned, that really addressing the whole of, of literacy and how important it is. 
and it's important for all our students. And this is inclusive of multilingual learners. And the use of local autonomy is important because even within some districts, you may have a transitional bilingual education, um, transitional program of instruction, dual language. You may have multilingual class uh, school districts and mono, you know, um, dual language programs and and bilingual, maybe just two languages. So every district and even schools within districts are so different that if there wasn't that local uh, autonomy, it would be really, really difficult to apply um, and create a literacy plan from this guidance uh, that would would fit. So it's it's really very happy to, I was, I was very happy to see that. Um, there, it is a very strength-based and um, asset-based approach and looking at what students bring, students and their families bring with them. Uh, and again, for multilingual learners, we're thinking of all their cultural linguistic resources, but it's 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 also true for all our students. And so it was really nice kind of universally to have that tone. There is explicit talk of biliteracy, which is important. And as Marie mentioned, wouldn't it be great to have um, multilingualism and multiliteracy? Uh, actually, uh, Dean um, also mentioned that the Dean of uh, DePaul. So, um, so it was really important to see that language explicitly uh, placed there. The focus on meaningfulness, uh, and it, it is so critical, critical for all learners, um, and also for multi, especially for multilingual learners, that their instruction, especially in their new language, is focused on meaning. So they can be working on skills and all aspects of literacy, but the central focus should be on understanding and meaningfulness, purposefulness for why they're doing what they're doing, and also critical literacy, um, so that we don't we have optimal literacy development, right? Not just the sort of basic skills, but really critical and really optimal literacy uh, instruction. And it was very exciting to see literacy as an ongoing developmental process. Often, too often, children who are learning in their second language are learn, are, are seen as um, somehow uh, as deficit. And we know that learning in the second language, language and literacy is, uh, is, a, is a developmental process and should be seen as such. Um, so, and it was really nice to see that the much of the sort of highly charged terminology for these national debates um, are mostly missing from the plan so that we can really just talk about literacy instruction and what we need to do in Illinois to support all, all of our students. And uh, so that was, that was really very uh, gratifying to see. In, in section one, uh, that re as uh, Kathy mentioned, presents the different um, aspects in the framework. Um, I want to highlight a few of those uh, bright spots. As Kathy mentioned, right, evidence-based does not mean a particular program. And really loved hearing that um, in writing or seeing in writing that research base is ever evolving. Even while we were negotiating and talking, there was already research coming on, um, uh, very exciting research around the teaching of literacy to multilingual learners and biliteracy teaching. And so um, if we were to put some very specific language in a uh, a, a particular method or a particular approach, either in legislation or in a literacy plan, that would undo that very exciting research base. And of course, that the research that we should be doing even in our own districts and collaborating with higher education to build that research base, there is that opportunity um, seeing the language in this plan. It's really great to see that the standards um, that are mentioned include um, the standards for English language development, as well as Spanish language development, Spanish language arts, and um, also very gratifying to see that there's information about the National Literacy Panel for language minority children and youth. Too often um, in the national debate, the talk has been about the National Reading Panel. In the early pages of that green book, which was the National Reading Panel, um, it clearly states that there, it does not include research for multilingual learners reading in the second language. That wasn't included. That wasn't part of their task. But in 2006, uh, the National Literacy Panel for Language Minority Children and Youth actually addressed the issue of teaching uh, multilingual learners. So it's it's great and it's hardly ever talked about. But too often the findings from National Reading Panel, which are monolingual English, um, are being applied to multilingual learners. Again, before you... <laughs> 
<laughs> think, oh my gosh, that's so much print. Uh, these are really this page and the next page are really resources for you to use. Um, obviously, you can, you're you're going to read the plan by yourself on your own. But I wanted to provide again, as always thinking as a practitioner. It, it's always nice to have like a little reference of like, where do I find this information, this specific language? So um, so this slide gives you, um, looks at the different components and tells you where they talk about uh, specific multilingual considerations. And then this slide um, on the pillars. So language related to pillars. Uh, there were just two things I wanted to point out in a page, um, on page 43, there is a little confusion around, um, it talks about simultaneous bilingual learners, which is really great, but then it talks about their stronger language. So I just wanted to clarify that, that I think that may have been a misprint because obviously with simultaneous bilingual learners have proficiency of both of those languages. So that literacy instruction is in both languages. Sequential bilingual learners have proficiency, are often more proficient in one language than the other. So there must have been a little bit of um just a little misprint there. So I wanted to make sure I, I mentioned that. And, um, but these are, these are for you for a reference. And then the last little bit is, um, there's some language in um, related to uh, MTSS. So I just wanted to share that with you. Um, so the, again, the bright spots is that um, there is a lot of emphasis on supporting teachers and I've, I've had the opportunity to observe school districts really take the stigma away from MTSS um, so that it isn't teachers like coming and asking for help, but that on the contrary, the district sets up the plans so that it goes out and, and um, seeks to support teachers in a proactive manner to really improve that core instructional learning environment for all the students um, who you know they have to su support. So I really like that. Um, and this is supportive for, uh, for multilingual learners as well. Um, and uh, there, there's also very specific language that the uh, core instructional learning environment for multilingual learners is there. Their tier one is their TBE, TPI, or dual language uh, classrooms. And um, so that was really, that was really very important. Um, one other thing. Um, piece here um, that Kathy mentioned around the the emphasis on standardized measures. What was gratifying to see in this MTSS section was there was a, a, a leaning on qualitative as well as quantitative data. So that honors uh, classroom-based instructional assessment, which is more nimble and allows us to really support multilingual learners in a more timely manner and really emphasizing problem solving. Um, uh, as, as an approach, which allows us to do more culturally linguistically responsive uh, MTSS. So the there the only thing I saw there was there was a little bit of a uh, little bit of deficit. You know, saying if too many students in a class are not performing, then you can implement a statewide a class wide intervention. So for me, that goes back to tier one that we need to support our our classroom teachers in 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 um, in tier one and. Um, so the, again, assessing students across all of their languages, uh, again, it's honoring that children are, have resources in both and across their language. There was still a little bit of every once in a while I find science of reading put in there. So again, we, we wanted to move away from jargon and really just talk about what we're talking about. Like if it's the research, uh, what is it in particular that we um uh, we're talking about because we're we don't want districts again. There's everyone's so busy to just grab something off and purchase something off the shelf just because that they stamp you know science of reading on there. We want um, to uh, districts to be very critical in um, in the curriculum they support, uh, the interventions they uh, choose, uh, etc. So um, I think I just have one more. Oh, I'm not, I think that was it. <laughs> so, um, and then again, same thing with what uh, Kathy mentioned, emphasizing the structured literacy. Again, the, um, the jury is still out on that approach for multilingual learners. There's some longitudinal studies that are being done, uh, sort of comparing structured English literacy uh, for multilingual learners and comprehensive literacy by literacy instruction. And um, we really have to wait for the science 
before we make these um, sort of decisions about one size fits all for, for everyone. I did want to just end by saying we we should really be proud as a state that we didn't jump on the bandwagon of these right to read bills. The inertia was there for it to happen again, to happen also in Illinois. Um, and, and in other states, there have been some really negative consequences for multilingual learners. So uh, in Illinois, I have to say, undertook a thoughtful process that brought together multiple stakeholders, stakeholder groups and representat- representation from across this entire state of Illinois. Um, so I'd like to turn this conversation over to Kathy for, um, to talk about next steps. Thank you, Christina. Um, so next steps, um, in the statute that Christina, um, discussed at the very beginning, there are, there's still work that needs to be done that is outlined there in statute. Um, By July 1st, there is a curricula evaluation rubric um, to be developed by uh, the state board, a template that districts can use for developing their own local literacy plans, and then guidance on effective practices for utilizing instructional coaches. Uh, We don't know yet what the plan is for getting these things accomplished or who's doing the work and how stakeholders will be engaged in the work, Uh, but that is that is what's up uh, immediately next as required by law. And then by January 1st of 2025, Um, There needs to be training opportunities available for literacy teachers. And then finally, by July 1st of 2026, the content area test for elementary grades one through six uh, will have to have some changes to include more literacy-based testing elements. So educators really have an important role as this work continues to move forward. And uh, there's advocacy that can be done at the state level, advocacy that can be done at the local district level. So at the state level, um, there are different ways to engage. So for example, when the first two drafts of the literacy plan were developed, the IFT submitted written public comment on both of those drafts. And our comments were informed by feedback received uh, from our educator members across the pre-K through 20 continuum. So, you know, we engaged our members in in state level advocacy as we developed public comment about those drafts and things that we wanted to see changed. Um, Secondly, uh, schools have got to be fully funded. We inequities exist in our school districts across the state due to decades of underfunding and inequities of resources. And uh, while we do have the evidence-based funding model, that is a step in the right direction. Uh, but on, but unfortunately, the minimum yearly increases means that schools won't actually b- be fully funded until 2042. So our our members' expertise and their research and research supports that um, a focus on inputs and resources and equitable and sufficient funding for public schools is going to positively impact student learning outcomes. It is definitely an equity issue. Um, And, you know, when we also consider the the science around um, trauma and and the impact that that has on children's brains and learning, and then the impact that historical instructional racism um, has perpetuated generational trauma for children of color and what that impact is on their brains and learning, we've got to make sure that our schools have the resources they need to create the conditions for children and and youth to heal from their trauma, to learn, and to thrive. So that's another area where there can be um, advocacy. And then, you know, finally, um, it would be really great to have a fully staffed agency. This literacy work is significant and it's comprehensive. And um, it would it would really be um, important to ha- be able to have more staff from the agency assigned not only to the development work, but to the work to support districts across the state as the work continues forward. Uh, at a local level, there are also lots of ways that educators can be um, engaged in advocacy. Teachers, paraprofessionals, local union leaders, Again, they need to be at every table where decisions about teaching and learning are being made. And, uh, you know, one of the things that you can do is push for a comprehensive pilot of potential new curricular materials so that those materials can actually be evaluated through experience and not just by a a review or by a sales pitch. Um, You know, you can determine as teachers whether or not the curricular materials are culturally relevant for the students that you serve. 
Um, you can ask questions like how much flexibility there is within the curriculum to adjust and meet the very needs of your students. What's missing from the curriculum? How, how is what's missing impacting teachers? How is what's missing impacting students? Um, and, and also, you know, demand to be at the table to, to plan professional learning experiences so that those experiences are meeting the varied needs of, of you all as professionals. Uh, professional learning should be happening with teachers and paraprofessionals. It's not something that should be happening to them. Um, another area of advocacy would be um, advocating for high quality induction and mentoring programs for early career educators so that they're getting the support and the professional learning that they deserve as they're beginning their career. That is not only going to increase teacher retention, but it's also going to increase early career educators efficacy and confidence and in literacy instruction and really make a difference there. There's also a role for teachers in um, policy and legislative advocacy because legislation and policy has a direct impact on the classroom. So engage in that advocacy. Talk to your locally elected representatives. Um, tell them what you need as an educator and how they can best support you. Your stories are impactful. Share your stories with them. And finally, um, take the time to review the literacy plan with your colleagues. Talk with your local union leaders about the concerns that you see and the supports you anticipate you would need from your district. And again, if your district is undertaking a process to develop a local district literacy plan, demand to be at that table. Um, that work should be happening with our teachers and paraprofessionals, not to them. Um, advocate for a broad, multifaceted approach to literacy instruction through that plan so that um, teachers have the flexibility to meet the needs of their students. Uh, and again, recognizing that one size fits all is not there, that doesn't exist. There is no one approach that's right for all students. So, what is it that educators want school boards to know? Because obviously, there is a role for school boards um, in this work as well. Number one, trust, trust your educators. Trust them, support them with the resources that they need to support diverse learners. Um, invest in your students. You can invest in your students with smaller class sizes, uh, wraparound services, really providing a broad and rich curriculum and those opportunities for, for your students in your district. And invest in your teachers and paraprofessionals with professional learning, with planning time, with collaboration time. And, and remember that no curriculum package that's out there is going to provide a quick fix that is going to meet the needs of all the learners in your district. Lean on your teachers, lean on your paraprofessionals to be at the table to help make those decisions. Um, and with that, I think I'm uh, kicking back to uh, Marie. Yeah, you're kicking. Yeah, thank you, Kathy. So thank you for the questions that you've been putting into the chat and please continue to pose some questions. I'm gonna turn back to Paul Thomas now. And Paul, would you please share with us your thoughts on what you're seeing in our plan and what your study of other plans and the recent histories have had you realizing? Yes. Uh, first, I'd like to say uh, uh, the last two presentations have been excellent. I think we definitely need to take those into consideration um, as you move forward. And one thing that I was thinking about as I was listening is, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, we've been in cycles of education reform for since the early 1980s. And more recently, No Child Left Behind in the National Reading Panel was a huge part of the No Child Left Behind. Uh, no Child Left Behind mandated scientifically based educational practices. And that top down education reform has resulted in less than 20 years that we are shouting that there's a reading crisis and we need reform. Uh, there's ample, if we're going to use evidence, there's ample evidence that this type of reform does not work. And I think one thing that you should have heard uh, throughout the last two presentations is uh, an absence in depending on the professionalism of teachers. Uh, we need to listen to teachers and we need to uh, lean on teachers for what the problems are and what the solutions should be. And I and I'm I'm uh, I'm a little bit optimistic. It sounds like that Illinois is moving in a direction that would allow that, but there uh, we have to stay uh, vigilant to make sure that happens. 
so uh, I want to end with saying, you know, buyer beware. Um, whether we say science of reading or not, a lot of these legislate, a lot of this legislation is coming out of uh, Jeb Bush's Excel and Ed. There's one reason they look similar. Uh, a template for reading uh, legislation is on the website at Excel and Ed. Many states are just downloading that, and that's where these um, these reforms start. Uh, I, I highly recommend this work by Compton Lilly and others. Uh, that raise some significant warnings about, and you heard just a minute ago, many states are mandating structured literacy. And you should keep in mind that structured literacy is a marketing term that came out of the International Dyslexia Association in 2014. Uh, literally, uh, there was a decision made that they had to find a term to sell what they do. And regretfully, structured literacy is just a, a, a cover for scripted curriculum. And scripted curriculum does two things that we've been warned about here tonight. It deprofessionalizes the teacher and it enforces on the classroom a one size fits all approach to instruction. Uh, neither of those are actually supported by science and neither of those are uh, effective and going to help our students or help our stu our teachers help our students. Um, and you'll see here um, uh, the 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 irony of this entire movement is embracing of things like decodable texts that have no research behind them. Science does not support that. And uh, once again, you've heard a theme here. We have to make sure that we don't just listen to publishers. And I think that's one of the problems is rebranding and marketing of what is best for students and what is best for teachers. Um, luckily, um, again, this, there's a lot of information here, but I do want to share this will be shared with everybody. There's a great deal of research coming out. Uh, already because many states started this move in, about 10 or 12 years ago. 2012 is kind of a, a watershed moment for these kinds of legislation. And uh, the work by Ranking and others, is this is extremely good. Uh, Edling, I highly recommend um, because it looks at the um, relationship between uh, stereotypes in the media and how that drives um, legislation. Uh, and then the misrepresentation of phonics and the Chaffin piece, uh, also the deprofessionalizing in teachers and the Blast, Blast Shield uh, piece. And then I would really emphasize this last piece um, because a, a great deal of research is showing that structured literacy programs are whitewashing the curriculum. The texts that are being in front, put in front of children are decontextualized and um, the uh, move in literacy to be more diverse is being erased by the science of reading movement. Um, so um, I've done, most of my work is on policy and I had a, a policy brief in 2022. And uh, again, these are, these are motifs, these are themes that you've heard throughout the night. We should not we should be wary of overstatements and oversimplifications, like there, there's a reading crisis, that teachers don't know how to teach reading, uh, that phonics is the uh, systematic phonics for all students is what was missing and what would be the solution. Um, and uh, again, I do, we should heed the warning about depending on uh, uh, standardized test uh, as our main evidence for whether or not students are learning to read. Um, and I cannot stress enough, the two things that I think are important is how do we support teachers to address the individual needs of all students? And uh, in too many cases, uh, mandates do the exact opposite of that. It deprofessionalizes the teacher um, and actually makes it impossible for the teacher to serve the needs of students. And the one warning that we we tried to uh, raise with my policy brief is one size fits all is never the right solution. Um, and um, some specifics that I think that we uh, could try to move toward. One thing that I think is uh, really important is that states stay away from grade retention. Uh, grade retention, uh, can raise uh, third and fourth grade scores. It does in states like Mississippi and Florida, uh, but 
it does hurt students. And uh, please keep in mind, and I can provide the evidence if you need it, uh, states that have raised third and fourth grade test scores have tremendous drop-offs by eighth grade, which shows that that is a mirage. It is not a miracle. Um, I think we need to de-emphasize standardized testing, uh, especially we overemphasize sort of grade three. It's an important uh, point, but it's not, um, uh, we shouldn't use it as a barrier to learning. Um, and I think we have to uh, ward against uh, mandates that say what can be taught and what cannot be taught. Uh, and these are things that we definitely should avoid. Uh, and overall, I would say the shift needs to be, let's start with teachers. Uh, every teacher knows what is best in the classroom. Uh, every, uh, all the teachers know what is best for a school. And um, we tend to start broadly and then impose. And I think we need to start narrowly with each teacher in each school and see what uh, challenges face them. Um, and then there are, there's, there's a lot of references here on, uh, on my slide, and I, and I strongly recommend that everybody here look at those. Uh, and I'll turn it back over to Marie. Thank you, Paul. So I've been combing through the uh, questions as well as the comments. And I'd like to start with um, some that are particular to the Illinois plan. And so Christina and uh, Kathy especially, uh, I'd like to hear more, from, we'd like to hear more from you. You know, one of the main concerns is that there are elements that won't be issued of the plan that won't be actualized and issued until the summer, in particular, the curriculum plan. And um, folks would like to hear some more from you about what should they, as educators, as administrators, as librarians, you know, anyone in a school who is responsible for children's literacy development, um, what what can what can, what should, you know, they be doing in their schools now to not only be ready for the plan, ready for the, um, especially the curriculum evaluation rubric, but also when the rubric comes out, reacting to that rubric, you know, where might their voices carry the most weight? So Christ Christina and Paul and Kathy, if you wouldn't mind turning on your your video and I don't know Christina or Kathy who wants to take that first. I, I can just start because I know districts are really need to purchase materials like you know uh, now and they're really looking at that but I, I just recently just this week was talking to a director uh, and they already have they're going to start with their equity rubric that they use um, within the district and 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 then look at the the student data and demographic and you know language proficiency level all of that so they have a lot of information to move forward and then because they have the literacy plan they they have a sense of what is being asked of them so there is something to get started and the other idea is that you know uh, a curriculum that you purchase I mean is a tool it's a it's as a teacher I like to have, you know, something to get started with, but then knowing that um, even a high quality resource, um, you know, math, literacy, whatever you purchase or a textbook, it's, uh, it it's doesn't have everything. So being able to um, invest time for teachers to be able to review and, and to have the support from their central office, their coaches, to be able to, um, you know, do some planning and then be supported throughout the year as they're implementing. And then as the curriculum uh, rubric comes out to be able to then do another level of analysis. But uh, districts and schools should trust themselves because they have so many really wonderful things in place. And um, I don't know if, th if that helps. Uh, I'll let Kathy and Paul. I think uh, I think what I would just build on what Christina said. For, well, first of all, we don't know what the rubric's going to look like yet, right? So, um, uh, you know, just to to reemphasize, um, leaning on your expertise as educators, um, librarians um, in in your district, um, leaning on the expertise that you have, the knowledge that you have, um, and 
and, you know, demanding to be part of the conversation and, the, and being at that table. And, and also recognizing that, to Christina's point, that the curricular materials are a tool and, and a, it's not going to offer you everything that you need. Also recognize that you are, you are already doing things and have materials um, available to you that are um, meeting the needs of your students and our, our um, assets based. And so, you know, doing, doing an evaluation of what you have and recognizing the things that are really working and holding on to those and, and identifying, you know, maybe these particular things aren't working as well for our students and what can we replace that with? Uh, it, you know, it's not necessarily throw everything out and start over, but to, you know, to start with what you have that's working. I would just like to add, there's a superintendent in Connecticut that says uh, teachers teach uh, children to read, not programs. And I do think we have to kind of, that's a, might seem simple, but it's a good mantra for us to focus on because I think the historical problem with reading is that we think that reading programs either fail or save our reading um, uh, uh, proficiency, and that's not true. Um, the grounding of whether or not children learn to read is their home, uh, their communities, and then teaching and learning conditions. If we don't put teachers in the position to be successful, they won't be successful. And we've never invested in teaching and learning conditions. So teachers teach children to read, not programs. You know, another question that comes up both tonight in some ways, and then um, when I've been ta talking about the plan, both with um, my current students as well as teachers and administrators I work with, is when people hear that it's a comprehensive literacy plan, their minds go to, oh, this is for kindergarten through second grade. You know, this is for the little kids. Yet, as we know, this plan is going to touch everybody. And I was wondering if you had some advice for those who teachers and, you know, and those who are focused, especially, you know, instructionally or otherwise on children from preschool through second grade, what can they be saying to their colleagues of those upper grades, including through high school, that hello, this is, this is affecting all of us. What's some advice that you have for those teachers, those education professionals? Well, I, I just I, I just submitted um, a series of four articles to English Journal for upper level for, you know, for secondary ELA teachers. And that was sort of the the goal of that. And I do think that we have to keep in mind that the the media and political messaging about literacy and teaching affects all of us. And if the information about literacy is misleading, it doesn't matter what age a child is it misrepresents what we're doing. So uh, honestly, if you're a teacher, uh, everything that's said about teaching affects you. If you are a literacy teacher, everything that's said about literacy affects you. And there's just a huge amount of misinformation and oversimplification about both. Um, so I think we all have to be advocates for a more complicated uh, message about literacy and teaching, and we have to really be advocates for students and teachers. Ethio, Christina, did you have something to say? Well, I was I was thinking I, I appreciated there was a whole section on uh, multilingual learners and biliteracy, and then a section that mentions uh, newcomers. Because the needs of newcomers, I mean, children could come in uh, from another country, for another, uh, per, per, perhaps asylum seeking um, ex children, um, students at any grade. And so we have to adapt the information and the plan to support maybe a child that hasn't had exposure to literacy in any language and they're in grade five or grade nine. So being, meaningfulness, you know, developmentally appropriate, all of that applies because we, again, we don't want to put a, a grade nine student in front of a, you know, little child's uh, phonics program, right? So, so that's the, the, the beauty of this idea of comprehensive literacy. There are principles that then we have to take with us throughout the grades. The other um, thing I was thinking that how important it is, 
I think for all learners, but again, I'll speak to multilingual learners, that um, that we did shift to comprehensive literacy from the start because there was too much talk of you you work on this skill and then once that skill is mastered, then you get to go on to this one and this one. And what that has resulted is that for um, for when that's uh, used with multilingual learners uh, in their second language or in their new language uh, in English, is that they um, they really by the time they get to grade three, they in English they may be decoders because that's what the emphasis was in their new language. So they get to grade three and they can decode, but because they haven't gotten the other pieces, content area knowledge, oral language, writing, and all of these other components, they get to grade grade three and they they are they're decoding or word calling without comprehension. And that's problematic. And uh, obviously for anybody, but um, not understanding that second language reading versus biliteracy reading versus reading in one's home language. Uh, so that uh, applies no matter what grade level the students are. You want to be, that's the importance of having all of these skills at your disposal as a teacher to work with students, whatever grade they are, not just looking at sort of splinter skills um, you know, at, at any given point. So whether they're in grade two or they're grade, you know, eight. The simple view of reading really isn't that simple. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we have to keep remembering that, right? But this brings me to another theme that's been emerging in both the comments and the questions in the chat. And that has to do with how do we as educators, whether we're administrators, uh, classroom teachers, reading specialists, you whatever role we're in, how do we educate the media? How do we educate our you know, community you know, members about what we do when we say we are building you know, these children's literacies? How do we push back against that narrative that it's all about, oh, you haven't been doing a good enough job and you have, certainly haven't been doing a good enough job in teaching enough phonics? Because that's what, you know, that's what, you know, all the, what you read in the blogospheres and such, right? That's what it's been reduced to. And yet we know it's so much more. What advice do you have for, again, administrators, teachers, doesn't matter your role. What advice do you have for them? I'll kick this one off. I think number one, it starts with the relationships that you have with um, your students and families. Um and, uh, you know, how you communicate the work that the learning work that's happening in the classroom, um, because we also know, you know, from multiple surveys over time that teacher or that parents trust that their their children's teachers. And, you know, I can think of a, a really specific instance when I was teaching where where um, a parent had talked to me because uh, they thought that um, the texts that I was selecting for um, their student during reading instruction weren't hard enough. Um, and, uh, and, and, you know, that helped to instigate a conversation around what, what my goals were for their student around reading comprehension in particular. And so that if I, if my focus was going to be on reading comprehension, the text wasn't going to be as you know, high level, because we wanted to really focus on being able to have deep conversations about the book, being able to write about the book and being able to, you know, think about reading in that way. And so when you can have those kinds of conversations with, with parents or with community members, I think that really goes a long way in um, building collective understanding of what, uh, what instruction uh, it should look like. And what classroom experiences can look like. I wanted to mention that it was it's been an education for me going through this process because um, I really appreciate listening to both Kathy and to um, Paul uh, the way they talk succinctly about certain things. I know that in our negotiations, um, you know, with the with the legislation, I was like trying to talk about the complexities and you know. <laughs> nobody wants to hear it. I mean, it's people, there's no time. There's no time to talk about these, you know, these complexities, but it was, what was an education to me was collaborating with other people who know how to do that. Like 
we need to collaborate within our districts, you know, really break down those silos and talk to one another, but also move outside of our, of our field. Because in education, I, I, I just have to say, I'm not very good at, you know, being succinct, but I can talk about the complexity. I can talk about that. But then, um, then I was put in a situation when I had only a couple of minutes to make this really complex thing you know, I, I've got one minute to explain this to a legislator or to somebody from the media. And then when I read what they wrote about what I said, I thought, hmm, that's not what I meant, but <laughs> because I'm not skilled at that. So I really, but then again, collaborating with the Latino Policy Forum, they are skilled communicators. They were brilliant. They are brilliant. And they I are. <laughs> I was just like being able to feel comfortable to know like what we know and what we we're not good at, and that's okay, but other people have strengths and we can collaborate to get the message across. Because I I find, you know, when some of this, it's overwhelming the the media, but there's a lot of money behind that. We're educators, I'm, I'm fortunate to say, when I don't have a lot of extra time or, you know, resources to travel here and travel there and to have these, you know, I, I just, I can't do it. I, and um, so the more we can collaborate, but I do wanna give a, um, you know, uh, uh, gratitude to the National Committee on Effective Literacy that have really tried to go um, nationally to have to to reach across different disciplines and different uh, communities and do joint uh, statements, you know, with other organizations about what do we agree on, you know, where are our differences, but what do we agree on? And they have podcasts and they have, you know, media uh, reports. So really trying, and we've never had to do that as much in education, but I think we have to, what we have to say is important uh, and we just have to learn how to do, I mean, I'm going to say, I have to learn to do it more effectively and then collaborate with those who do uh, know how to, how to, how to communicate. All how do you push against the media narrative that's out there? I wish I knew. Um, <laughs> but, so um, one experience I've had is I was interviewed by 60 Minutes uh, by a producer, was thinking about doing a story on this. And after I gave him the complicated story, he literally said, there's no story there. And that's our problem. Um, the misleading story is very compelling. So if you listen to um, uh, Sold a Story, which I'm not encouraging you to do, it's melodramatic. Uh, the music's melodramatic. The stories are melodramatic. And regretfully, I do think what is on our side is there, there are now stories of parents with children who don't want to sit through systematic phonics because the children came to school uh, already reading and they want to go further. Uh, so I do think, uh, you know, and, 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 you know, Kathy said this a minute ago, um, our relationships with our parents about the real struggles and successes of the real students in front of us. Uh, I think that's where we have to start because I've had no luck with any journalist really willing to listen to the counter narrative uh, and this whole movement is about stories. Uh, but there are children in our classrooms who need that individual attention. And I, I just keep hitting on that. It's our our goal is to meet the individual needs of every child. And they're all different. Uh, so I do think I, we have to focus on that. We have a story. And I think that's what's compelling. I agree with you, Paul. I just wanted to say that that in that was a big shift in the negotiations and it came from a classroom teacher who talked about if I were to do what's in this, when I was a classroom, she said, when I was a classroom teacher on the Southwest side of Chicago, if I would have had to do exactly what this legislation says in first grade, I would have lost so many students. She said, because I had students who were in grade one who were not quite reading yet. And then I had students who were great reading at grade three level. So if I would have done what was in this legislation, I would lose my students. And that was the moment that changed everything in the negotiation. So I agree with you, Paul, the story is very compelling because um, we don't want unintended harm to any child. And so what? What? Uh, I think we need to tell the story. So I, I appreciate that you brought that up. Yeah, one thing I would point out is, uh, you know, uh, one thing that's really dangerous, and it was mentioned earlier, is the dependence on nonsense word assessments. And students who already are 
comprehending and reading often do poorly on nonsense word assessments because they're seeking meaning, which is the whole point of decoding. It's the whole point of under phonics is a tool to create meaning. And these are real stories. And we've got children out there who are struggling with what is, I would say, is a, you know, an inauthentic way of assessing reading. And those are the kind of stories we can depend on. Now, at I the have, risk of going a... over, if oh. I may, at the risk of going over, I have to ask this question because it was put in the chat and I didn't ask somebody to put it there. But I would like each of you to tell me, tell us one thing that you want us in teacher preparation programs to be thinking about, to be teaching our students. Based on all the work you've been doing, what you realize about this plan. I think somebody said it a minute ago, and I keep saying this, nobody's ready the first day and nobody can be. Uh, nobody can be fully prepared. That's not what we're trying to do. Uh, the way we prepare people to teach is we prepare them to not be prepared. And uh, we are all learning. I, I just said this, I've been teaching 40 years. I change every semester how I teach because I'm learning. So I think that hyper urge to be fully prepared day one is really setting up everybody to fail. I, I agree that I, I, I've seen in Illinois programs where uh, there's an option for the last year of teaching to be actually in a school district the whole year, like these professional learning schools. So it ends up feeling like your first year of teaching, but you have a lot of support. That's one of the things I think you, you go into teaching in an indeterminate zone of practice, you know, a lot of things. And then, uh, and then all of a sudden you're in front of those students and it's not, you know, exactly who you thought you were going to be teaching, but if you're equipped and you have mentors and you like uh, Kathy was talking about, if it's lifelong, I am so grateful for my school district to have invested in me as an individual, as a teacher. I always felt supported. And I, I was talking, to, you know, as we prepared, I talked to Kathy about that so that it's continuous. But that that those sort of professional learning uh, schools where, you know, you're you have the option that your your student teaching can actually be in a school district and and really feel like your first year teaching with with a lot of support. Um, Thanks. That's a. That's and I know. A, I know. My dean was listening, especially to that part. <laughs> that <laughs> was a really great. That too. Really great question, Marie, and and I concur with what both Paul and Christina said. And I think what I would add is that contextually, the vast majority of of new teachers that are entering the profession grew up in No Child Left Behind. They grew up in this environment of test and test prep and you know their schools potentially being punished because of student test scores. And so I think what would be really important to um, reinforce is that um, each of those data points represent children, represent youth. Don't lose sight of the humans who are who are with you every day. You are not developing data machines, you are developing humans and um, so important and build those relationships because that will go far. Amen, thank you for that. Well, thank you, thank you, you three. Thank you, our audience who joined us. Thank you in advance to those who will be viewing our recording, all of you who registered to uh, be part of this this evening. You will be receiving, as I said before, a link to the recording of this event, as well as uh, the slide decks used, as well as the bios of our presenters. And so again, thanks everybody. Thanks so much for gathering around your screens and talking this through, thinking this through. Have a good rest of the week. Bye-bye.
Hi. Hi, Diane. Bye.